Bob Herbert's op-ed.tv is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation with the support of Ann Ulnick. Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. Like so many other journalists, I got my start at a newspaper, covering local stories like city council and board of education meetings, municipal corruption, crime and public safety issues, and so on. That kind of local coverage is in crisis. It's disappearing. And the ramifications for all of us are vast, but not always obvious. My guest runs an organization that has taken a deep dive into the decline of local news coverage in the United States and the disturbing consequences of that decline. She's Suzanne Nossel, chief executive of PEN America, which has just put out a report with the disturbing title, Losing the News, the Decimation of Local Journalism and the Search for Solutions. Ms. Nossel, thank you for coming in. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So um, for those who don't know, explain what PEN America is, and uh, describe this alarming study that you guys undertook. Yeah, sure. So PEN America is an organization that both celebrates and defends freedom of expression here in the U.S. and worldwide. We're an organization of writers, novelists, poets, essayists, journalists, who come together to fight against threats to free expression and to build bridges and dialogue across difference and amplify the voices of those who are lesser heard. And so it's interesting, we came to this topic, we've always sort of thought of ourselves as a national organization and we've had members, writer members across the country, but really our, most of our programming overwhelmingly, historically was here in New York. After the 2016 election, we began to get more focused on our members across the country. And I think the whole country <laughs> sort of started thinking more about what right. was happening between the two coasts. And as we reached out to our members, we were quite preoccupied with the threats to free expression emanating from the White House in Washington, cries of fake news, the rise of disinformation, the denigration of the news media. But when we went across the country, we encountered a different problem. And when we talked to our members, what was uppermost on their minds was what was happening at the local level and the fact that news outlets that they had relied upon or been part of, in many cases, worked for, helped to build up over decades were in this state of chronic decline and that the sources of information that communities depended on for their democracy, for an informed citizenry, uh, to inf uh, infuse their debates with knowledge, insight, uh, investigative reporting, all of that you know, we discovered was withering away. And so for us, as a way of connecting with our members and kind of meeting them where they were and taking on the concerns that were top of mind for them, this project rose to the foreground. And we decided to do an in-depth study of this issue of the, de the, the decline in, in local news. And at first, we conceived it as news deserts. We thought, well, you know, we'll focus on these kind of select communities where, you know, papers have been shut down and right. news staffs have been cut back. And, you know, we'll, we'll sort of spotlight the parts of the country where that's the case. And what we came to as we began the research is it's not a matter of isolated deserts. You know, this is a systemic problem. This is happening, you know, with a few exceptions of really, you know, perhaps New York, Washington, D.C., uh, and very few others. Every community is affected by this kind of categorical, wholesale transformation of media that has led to a decline in newspapers, in reporting staffs, in investigations, and in the resources that underwrite all of that. At these um, specific news outlets, and, and, and it is, it's widespread, as you, as you guys found out, all across the country, what's actually happening? I mean, uh, cutbacks or papers closing or... Give us a sense of uh, what's actually going on. You know, it's kind of a series of things that have come together. You know, historically, uh, you know, for many decades, most of the 20th century, we had this model where 
people were interested in knowing about their local communities. They wanted, you know, basic information like what's on the lunch menu, what's the weather right. going to be like, you know, who's on the ballot in the upcoming election, you know, but also, you know, more serious and probing coverage, you know, who's corrupt, where's the money going, why is that big building, you know, coming up over here, you know, what's happening to the water that we're drinking. And the way that coverage was underwritten was through display and classified advertising. Yep. So there were businesses, it could be auto dealerships, department stores, uh, real estate, all of that uh, had an interest in getting in front of those consumers. And the way that happened was a morning and sometimes an afternoon newspaper. So the news and information were packaged together with the advertising. The advertiser had the eyeballs that they were seeking out and the consumer uh, had this access to information and the advertising revenue underwrote very substantial reporting staffs where you yeah. had you know 500 person reporting staffs you know in places like Denver, Colorado uh, or 700 people uh, at the Atlanta Journal Constitution so people covering different beats they'd be you know education reporter a health reporter a city council reporter you know somebody focused on the mayor's office uh, people focused on outlying uh, different neighborhoods on water issues transportation issues and you know that made for an informed citizenry and it was a system that worked and that created this this social good of a knowledgeable populace and then of course you know, that model changed and fell away with the rise of the internet, you know, first classified advertising migrated online. Yeah. It was a hell of a lot easier to search out the kinds of listings that you were looking for, uh, you know, than it was in a, a traditional print paper. And then display advertising has migrated to search engines and to social <laughs> media. And so that market for the, you know, the big full page ad that we think of, uh, you know, from, from uh, times, you know, long ago with autos in it or houses in it or clothing from a department store, <laughs> all that fell away. And this is all the stuff I used to do right, for a living. Right. This was my environment. But. Yeah. And, and, you know, so you've seen what's happened. So the papers have thinned out of advertising and, you know, that has led to just this vicious cycle of death by a thousand cuts to reporting staffs and there's been consolidation you know yeah. as owner papers have gone bankrupt some have closed down we've seen about 20 percent of newspapers across the country shut their doors entirely and you know the rest have cut their reporting staffs by you know often in, in many cases 50 percent or more and so what they maintain now is really a shadow of its former self all those beat reporters you know they're gone and there's kind of a crucible of a small staff that's kind of trying to cover everything and not able to apply the kind of scrutiny that's necessary to hold government accountable, to keep people informed, to probe into wrongdoing. Uh, and that, that core function of a, a, a local media outlet and democracy is, is fading away. And a lot of the publications, a lot of newspapers have just gone out of business. I mean, you know, there's been the shrunken staffs and they don't have the money to do the kind of investigative work that they used to do. But a lot of them are just gone. Yeah, a lot of them is. I mean, you used to have two or three newspaper towns. Exactly. You know, that first, that right. went. That was you know, common. And then, right, and then yeah. you had sort of the, you know the one newspaper town, and you know now sometimes you have the zero. You made the point that there's no natural market correction to this problem that's been going on. Um, explain what you meant by that. You know, just in a sense, we were lucky that that confluence of interest between advertisers and the public's need and right to know kind of converged and came together for as long as it did. But, you know, there's nothing to say that, you know, somebody's going to have an interest in paying for that daily newspaper to be right. delivered to your doorstep. And in fact, you know, we're, we're finding, you know, uh, systemically that nobody does. And so, you know, there's also a vicious cycle where the paper thins out, it's less interesting, it's less compelling, subscription rates go down, they have to slash prices for subscribers, so subscription re revenue itself withers, and the sense of the essential character of the paper, you know, the, the importance yeah. of it to people, you know, also diminishes. You guys describe it um, in very serious terms. You, you, you say that it's a crisis, which I wholeheartedly agree with. Uh, you talk about the way some communities have been frayed as a result of this. Talk a little bit about the consequences of losing the kind of local reporting that you're talking about. Sure. I mean, for from our perspective, it represents a crisis for democracy because democracy depends on an informed citizenry. People have to be able to make educated decisions about who to vote for, what positions to take 
on issues. They have to be able to scrutinize their leaders and make sure they're doing a good job. They're serving the interests of their constituents, that problems are being dealt with. And we've relied on the media for decades to perform that intermediary role and probe into those questions and allow the citizen to perform their role. And when the media is gone, you know, the quality of our democracy really deteriorates. And you have people making decisions based on the last thing they read on social media or a piece of fake news that has been uh, served up to them in a feed or a piece of propaganda you know, that might originate in Eastern Europe or Russia and they have no idea where it right. came from. And so we have people relying on sources of information that are not dependable or trustworthy or going uninformed. And we also have officials who are unscrutinized. We have one guy in the paper saying, you know, he could commit a murder. He's a public official in, in Denver, Colorado, you know, and get away with it. And, right. you know, we know we're living in that kind of environment here where we no longer can rely on these authoritative sources to tell us what's what, to put the information in front of us, to help us make sense of it. It's been going on for quite some time um, now. So a lot of people have grown up without any kind of robust new local uh, news coverage. Um, give us a sense of what concerns you ab about that kind of environment. Young people growing up, never having really known uh, real solid local reporting. Yeah. I mean, I think we face a, a big question about sort of how we raise a citizen in the 21st century, you know, what that means, how we inform young people about, you know, their role in society, the responsibilities of government, what government should be prohibited from doing, you know, what to expect from a police officer or a teacher or a principal. And local news is a big part of that. It's a piece of how you get informed. You know, before you get informed about what's happening in Washington or in Europe or in Asia, you know, it, it makes sense to first get a grip on your local community. You know, where does the power sit? What are the different interests? What are the different opinions? You know, those are issues that as a child or a teenager you can relate to, you can see in front of you. There's a whole kind of piece of, I think, how we school our citizens that is uh, missing and, and, and vulnerable as local news fades away. You mentioned that, um, you know, in the old days, reporters tended to have beats. They might cover labor or politics or health or education and that sort of thing. And in many cases, um, these local beats, the reporters would cover local stories and they would end up becoming big national stories. The extreme example uh, would be uh, Watergate. Woodward and Bernstein were local metro reporters at, at the uh, Washington Post. But there were an awful lot of stories. Talk a little bit about how, how local stories have frequently emerged into big, powerful national yeah, stories. Yeah, sure. I mean, in recent years, you see the Flint water crisis, yeah. you know, which began as a very a local story in an impoverished community. You know, it also bears mentioning, I don't want to glorify the halcyon days of local news because there were always inequities. There were always stories that weren't covered, communities that were left out, neighborhoods that were... Uh, away from the public eye. And so it was never an equitable system. And, you know, Flint was an example of that, of a poor community where, you know, this the terrible decision was made to switch the water supply and lead poisoning became widespread. And it began as kind of a local environmental story and then broke open into a huge national crisis in terms of, you know, how we treat less advantaged communities in this country. The lead crisis, of course, was not confined to Flint. It prompted cities across the country to test their own water. Many of them found that they had similar problems. So, you know, that's just one small example. You know, have a story like the Larry Nasser, the gymnastics story, oh goodness, you know, that, right. uh, you know, is about a single coach, but actually has affected, you know, our entire USA gymnastics program and hundreds of gymnasts. So, Many of these stories, whether uh, it is because, you know, the tip of the, the spear is sort of a, a, a sim, what looks like a simple break in and then turns out to implicate yep. the president or because it's a, it's a trend or a phenomenon that is not limited to that one community, but that replicates itself or is manifest elsewhere that, you know, once a single community starts to realize, oh, there's a backlog of rape kits that we've never tested, yeah. you know, here in Tulsa, you know, well, that might be true in hundreds of cities across the country. But that local reporter, by breaking the story, is one who brings that out into the open. And uh, in many cases, uh, readers will say, wow, that's, a, that's the sort of thing that really happened to me or happened to a friend or relative of mine, and it prompts people to come forward. 
And again, these stories, they begin very small and then they develop into something um, that can have prof a profound effect. Um, the, uh, a lot of people don't even realize that this is, uh, has been occurring. Apparently there was a, a Pew study that showed that 70% uh, uh, of um, local people didn't even understand that, that they weren't getting the kind of local coverage um, that they probably should have been getting. They found that their local news, out they, they thought their local news outlets were actually doing very well. Um, how can people, how is it that people do not understand that this is going on? Do you have a sense of that at all? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it's kind of this slow drip drip uh, where the quality of the local paper has declined and so, you know, those who remember the days of a fat newspaper where you could spend, you know, a good 45 minutes in the morning, you know, paging through and absorbing different stories, you know, people barely even remember that. So some don't recognize that what they have in front of them is a shadow of its former self. You know, you still have local television. And, you know, but what we found in this report is that overwhelmingly local TV outlets rely on the print papers to do the initial investigations. And then they, you know, they pick up on the story. They may call in the mayor for an interview and hold him accountable and make him squirm on screen. And, you know, that's a powerful role as well. But if that initial investigation, which overwhelmingly was sort of the responsibility of the print paper, doesn't happen, uh, you know, they never get him there in the first place. So, I think that's part of it. I think we also are in an age where you're deluged with information, you know, through your social media right. feeds, the internet. And so, you know, nobody is lacking for something to read or for some, you know, piece of information that's popping up, <laughs> uh, you know, I in the middle of your day and keeping you occupied. But that's not the same thing. And people actually it. think they are well informed. Right, right. Uh, so, you know, but that's not the same as really knowing what's happening around exactly. you and being able to see through and see beyond the surface. Now, this is not a woe is me study where uh, it just focused on how how bad things have become and then moved on. There are actually uh, suggestions about some of the things that we might do. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure, I mean, we don't see any single silver bullet, but what we do see is a kind of raft of different innovations that are popping up in particular communities and cities. There's been an infusion of philanthropic interest in the news sector, and so we see some very important national investigative reporting outlets, organizations like ProPublica or the Marshall Project that have come up that are doing stories sort of in, in, in the stead of, you know, what used to be done by uh, important city papers. So they have investigative reporters that are taking on some of that work and cracking important stories, so that's great. And then you also have at the local level a lot of uh, startups that are quite scrappy. A lot of them are made up of former journalists, you know, from the city paper who were laid off and had to reinvent themselves and now maybe have an online news site uh, or they're relying on citizen journalists or they're, you know, they're kind of pulling things together and innovating and trying to discover new business models, working on subscription models, doing things at a much lower cost. So there are some kind of little green shoots that are popping up. But overwhelmingly, you know, our conclusion was, unfortunately, you know, that pace of innovation and change uh, is not the equal to the problem. Right. You know, we see a, a revenue gap of about $35 billion in lost Whoa. advertising revenue for local news and the, film, the entire national philanthropic se sector uh, for news and information right now is, you know, maybe half a billion, uh, you know, perhaps at a stretch. And so... There's a glaring gap, and what we kind of came to is that, look, news, local news is a public good. This is something that we need to enable our democracy to function. So we need to rethink this and look at models where there's a more significant infusion of public funding. You know, who have been the beneficiaries of the local news uh, crisis? Well, it, it's online companies that have sucked away the advertising money right. and now uh, provide advertisers their platforms on social media and through search. And so there have been these kind of tentative efforts, voluntary efforts to, you know, kind of pay it back and invest in local news. But we think that has to be looked at at a much more dramatic level. You know, there are proposals that have been made of link taxes that would, 
you know, essentially excise a little bit from the advertising revenue that goes online and feed it back to underwrite local news. There's an innovative proposal uh, that was implemented or is in the process of being implemented in New Jersey about uh, tax on spectrum that is being used to invest in local news. Unfortunately, the amount of money involved has, has been dramatically reduced, and so it's going to end up being kind of a very small pilot project. But there are states that are beginning to recognize that news is a public good and that they may need to invest in it. And so, you know, we encourage that exploration. We think at the national level there ought to be a congressional commission that examines this problem, that looks at the centrality of local news to our democratic system and that evaluates these different solutions, including international models that have worked and, you know, including in countries that are renowned for freedom of the press. So as a free expression organization, Frankly, we were pretty hesitant to even <laughs> contemplate a bigger role, whether it's state or a federal government. We don't really want the government to be involved in the news, but we recognize that you know, there are models of government funding in the arts and the humanities for scientific research, and that in some countries it's working and it shouldn't be off the table. When you start talking about uh, public funding, and, um, and, and we may absolutely have to go to a much greater degree of uh, public funding, um, what are some of the things that concern as, uh, journalists, um, uh, uh, writers, um, artists, and that sort of thing, when the government becomes involved in these in these matters? Sure, I mean it's it's that it becomes politicized. Yeah. That you have political officials with their own agendas who you know want to stay in office, who want to serve their patrons, who want to tilt policy in the direction that they favor and that those who are covering them and holding them accountable are beholden to them. You know, that's the fear, that the journalists will not be able to be objective or independent if they're dependent on the governments that they cover to underwrite their own livelihoods and businesses. So I'd say that's the fundamental concern, but we do see in other arenas and in other countries ways of correcting uh, and preventing that through gating mechanisms where there's a separation of several layers between whatever body or outlet it is that actually decides you know whether to make a grant to the arts or to the humanities and you know those who are in elective office so there are ways of ensuring that that political influence is kept away from the function that government might serve in a larger way. You know, that does serve to some degree today through PBS uh, in terms of underwriting our media. Do you feel that there are reasons to be optimistic that we might be able to overcome at least to some significant degree this problem? You know, I, I hope so. I think there is a lot of energy and sort of intellectual firepower that's being applied to this problem. And, journalism schools and circles. There's been an enormous amount of study and dialogue. One of the things we wanted to do with this report is sort of bring that out into the open uh, to our membership and to a wider audience because we feel that conversation, you know, shouldn't be one that's just taking place, you know, in the pages of the right. Columbia Journalism Review or the Pointer Institute. It needs to be brought into the mainstream. We've had a lot of interest on Capitol Hill in this report. You know, this affects every representative's own community. So it is something that they see uh, and that matters to them. And so we're in dialogue with several offices on the Hill about bringing forward these proposals. So I am hopeful that we're gonna find our way through this, but it's it's gonna be by taking this problem seriously. It's gonna be tough. We're Not gonna easy. Keep our fingers crossed. Thank you so much, Suzanne Nossel, Pen America. Thank you. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. We keep hearing about how well the economy is doing, how high the stock market is climbing, and how low the unemployment rate has become. What we don't hear a lot about is the disturbing fact that income inequality in the United States has reached the highest level ever recorded. This has occurred even as we are going through the longest economic expansion in all of American history. The economy is doing great all right for those who are already well off. For ordinary, hard-working men and women, not so much. 
Simply stated, nearly all of the benefits of the booming economy have gone to the highest income Americans. Most workers, after adjusting for inflation, have not seen a significant rise in their incomes in decades. Why is this happening? Primarily because voters keep electing politicians who do the bidding of the very rich. Among other things, these lackeys, that's what they are, repeatedly enact tax cuts that benefit the very wealthiest among us. George W. Bush was the only president in history to engineer tax cuts while the nation was at war. Guess who benefited from those tax cuts? Donald Trump has heaped every kind of tax cut he could imagine on the wealthiest Americans while relying throughout his presidency on the solid support of constituents who are anything but wealthy. It's not just the tax cuts. Conservative office holders especially have waged brutal warfare against labor unions and other efforts by workers to act effectively on their own behalf. And these politicians have gone out of their way to block not just the living wage, but even modest increases in the minimum wage. The way to counter this economic abuse of ordinary working people is to become well-informed about these matters, really well-informed, and vote for candidates who will work to expand the economic well-being of all Americans. Don't vote against your economic interests. It's an idea as old as the republic itself. That's all for now. See you next time.